okay welcome to robotics 2 robotics 2 deals with aerial robots robots that fly in this class i'm going to cover two types of robots one is a fixed wing uav wherein it's like planes autonomous planes and then in the later part i would be talking about the quadcopters or rotor crafts please understand these robots are no different than the robots that you studied in robotics one the only difference is in the robotics one you had the coordinate transformation wherein the robot lengths or links had fixed distance but here since your end effector think about it like it's flying then you are going to have some type of an extending uh, uh, prismatic joint and that prismatic joint also rotates so uh, conceptually it's slightly different but at the end of the day math is going to be the same we are going to use the same coordinate transformations remember the four rules that we talked about in last uh, class <coughs> same stuff we are also going to talk about the rule pitch and yaw we are also going to talk about different frames intermediate frames and then we will perform the forward kinematics inverse kinematics forward dynamics and inverse dynamics but when we studied robotics one the advantage was that the ground frames uh, were fixed intermediate frames were fixed to different joints and they were easier to visualize in aerial robotics you will realize that understanding different different frames takes some time but i will develop those frames step by step and then at the end uh, i promise you everything will come together now as you know i don't personally believe in exams so oh there is some, one smart guy who is attending over zoom <laughs> so i don't believe in exams so there is there are no final exams there are only projects and assignments but i have to caution you uh, some of those assignments the assignments are like theory part writing uh, doing some literature review solving some simple problems the projects are going to be intense wherein you will have to learn how to program inside the simulink how to interface c with simulink how to interface maybe a flight simulator software with the simulink how to integrate the flight gear which is a flight simulator with the simulink and then understand different blocks and sensors so they are actually intense and and as soon as i assign the first uh, project you will realize how intense they are but do not worry i don't expect that uh, you to basically go from a to z in one go i will be there to help you so what will happen is i would actually solve part of the problem in class to the point that i i know that everyone can get to the finish line and the good news is uh, my phd student jacob who is smarter than me who is sitting in the back is here he has the solutions so uh, basically uh, uh, are you going to uh, have some office hours every week yeah, yeah so uh, he will be there to help you during the office hours in case your matlab course are not working if your uav is not flying if you are not able to trim your uav if the paths don't make sense then jacob is there to help you and all the projects uh, i would actually develop them so that you kind of understand how to work on the project so if i assign your project 
the first reaction is going to be, wow, this is crazy. But don't worry about it. We will develop it step by step inside the sibling. We will understand the theory, uh, do the coding. We will also use the MATLAB blocks and libraries that are available to help us. So it's going to be a step by step and a gradual process. Attendance is not required. So if you want, you can attend the class over Zoom. The only problem with attending over Zoom is some of these assignments are so intense that it, I have found it extremely difficult to convey uh, over the Zoom. Because what I have to do is I have to explain part of it on the board. Then I have to show it on the screen. Then actually I have to program it on the MATLAB and then I have to show how it works. So unfortunately you can't do this type of stuff uh, in a Zoom environment. So as far as possible, come to class. But for some reason, if you are not able to come to class, if you want to attend it over the Zoom, that is fine. If you want to watch the videos asynchronously, and that is also fine. The videos will be uploaded onto the Canvas website. I will be here every, as a matter of fact, I will be here every day. I'm teaching class six to 7.15 every day. So my office hours for every class is going to be after the class. So if you come to class, you can actually stop by and then uh, after the class, and I would be happy to help you with your doubts, questions. Again, the course description is design of robotic system focusing on dynamics model controlling of a robot. Tuesday, Thursday, we are going to meet here. EGR 455 or 545 or 547, I mean 547 is required. And I use MATLAB. That's why I asked you to finish all the MATLAB uh, certification and courses in robotics one. So my understanding is when you come to robotics, you have some baseline familiarity with MATLAB and Simulink. Otherwise, uh, it will be very difficult. Now, in terms of course structure, there are two textbooks. And uh, I, I mean, those are fantastic textbooks. One is the small unmanned aircraft theory and practice. Uh, this book I'm going to use for the fixed wing aircrafts like airplanes. And the second book is introduction to uh, multi-copter design and control that I'm going to use for the quadcopter. And let me tell you, this course is not supposed to be an aero elasticity course. This is not, this is not the course for the aircraft structure design. This course is about robot. How would you design the flying robot? How would you derive the differential equations of motion for the flying robot? How would you control? How would you identify the forces on that robot? How would you control the robot? How do you make that robot? fly from point A to point B. This is what this course is going to be all about. So even though you may not have background in aerospace, I will give you all the material that you need to understand the fundamental concepts of aircraft design and structures. It's very straightforward. There is one thing I just want to tell you. Unfortunately, in this entire curriculum, we don't teach our students another important class of robots. If you are taking EGR 550, perhaps you are going to look at PLCs, programming, uh, putting the automation systems together. So that's good. But it is an important class of robots. For example, the 3D printer that you use is an XYZ Cartesian robot. The CNC machine that you use is also a robot. Five axis CNC, wherein what you have is, if you think about it, you, you construct a CAD model, 
you construct an STL. After that, if you are going to do additive manufacturing or if you are going to do subtractive manufacturing, you perform the forward and inverse kinematics and create something called as the G code. G code controls the motion of the actuators. And that actuators could be X, Y, Z slide, extruder. In the case of additive manufacturing, if you are going to use uh, it for a CNC application, if it's a five axis CNC, it will be rotation about two axes, speeds, feeds, depending upon the material removal. So at the end of the day, concept is the same. So this semester, and the reason for that is uh, uh, industry is asking for it. So we have had so much, so many meetings with industry uh, as, as we were talking about this science and technology center. They were saying that we need students who understand the relationship between the all the, the common theme between all these robots. At the end of the day, the fundamental principles are the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, conduct a 10 hours short duration course on robotics of additive and subtractive manufacturing, wherein I would actually, again, there is no credit for it. It's not required for you to attend, but it is just for something to, if you're really and deeply interested in robotics, uh, that is something you should know because robotics one, we do articulation, the robot arm, robotics two, we look at uh, the aerial robots, flying robots. The only other important part that I would really like our students to learn is how these robots come together in an automation setting that is covered in mechatronics uh, systems, which is EGR 550. But the last part is how these concepts in robotics are applicable for metal working, like additive manufacturing or subtractive manufacturing. Unfortunately, we do not have a course in robotics, in additive or subtractive, or for that matter, semiconductor. Semiconductor manufacturing. So, uh, the ten-hour course, a short course, uh, would be post focused on that. But again, uh, the seats will be limited. I will announce it over the LinkedIn, and there will be an event bright that you have to register. Uh, it will have some hands-on activities. Uh, so you may have to purchase the raw material. It will be about 20, 30 bucks. So you can purchase the raw material because we would be actually machining uh, from balsa wood or machining from uh, uh, wax. We won't machine stainless or high carbon steel, something like that, but a small, simple, easier, lighter materials we will machine. So that way give, will, it will, you'll, you'll get a very practical understanding of how the G code works. How basically you go from a CAD model slicing to the G code, implementing the G code on the stepper motor drivers and how the stepper motors get control. So I will announce it later in, in the semester. So again, we will in particularly for this class, we will be looking at robot kinematics dynamics. We will look at the system hardware, software, uh, how, do, how to become uh, successful attend all the classes, please do not fall behind. If you need additional help, come see me or see uh, the TA. There will also be, there will be a grader as well. I will announce the contact information of Jacob and uh, Teja who are going to be helping us. And again, this course will have projects. This course will have assignments. So typically you will have six projects. Uh, they would they could involve maybe a building uh, a small model of the plane or maybe programming or creating some MATLAB scripts, simulating files, uh, performing some type of simulations, uh, interfacing uh, with hardware and so on. The assignment would be sort of erotical. So the, the assignments, the purpose of the assignment is you kind of review the theory part. 
there will be some homework, some MATLAB programming. Uh, plus minus grading is not used in this course. The grades are A to E. Uh, it's very difficult to get a grade below B. You have to work really, really hard. But most of my students uh, get an A. Uh, do not submit assignments late. Uh, but of course, if there is a valid reason, I will give you extension. And please be aware of add and drop deadlines. Don't miss assignments, uh, course evaluation, syllabus disclaimer. And these are the different, different uh, chapters uh, that I will go through as, as we uh, proceed to the course. So uh, again, material is straightforward. Uh, there are going to be some projects, some assignments, some lessons on quadcopters. Uh, again, these are the standard university policies. If you need any help or if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask me. All the slides along with the video lectures uh, should be available in a day or two on Canvas. And at this point, I would like to ask you if there are any questions Are there are any questions about the course the the material okay so let's get on to it so in today's class first what i would like to do is i would like to give you a brief overview of the material uh, that we are going to discuss. And this is actually the chapter one from the textbook. This chapter one will kind of give you the lay of the land, what we are going to talk about. So this uh, course, at least the first part of the course, follows pretty much exactly the way the book is written. So small unmanned aircraft is the book. Uh, that is what we would use for the first uh, uh, aircraft uh, UAVs. So what are the different applications of small UAS? UAS is uncrewed aerial vehicles or uncrewed aerial systems. They can be used to monitor the environment. They can be used to monitor the disaster areas. They can be used as communication relays for law enforcement, precision agriculture, and so on. There are a lot of military applications of the drones. So for an example, predator drone is an excellent example, wherein uh, they can be also used for ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, ISR type of activities, communication node, you can actually use them for battlefield uh, uh, applications or damage assessment. Homeland security, air mobility for humans, goods and services. As you might, if you see, uh, people have been trying to work on uh, flying cars, which is like an aircraft that can take off, fly, and then it can have, it, it's like a car. Uh, before coming to ASU, I worked on Bell 609 aircraft program and uh, we designed the flight control system for Bell 609. So if you see uh, the Bell 609, which is a combination of the aircraft and a uh, uh, rotor craft. So what it, it, it's a tilt rotor, which means the aircraft takes off as a helicopter. Those rotor, they tilt and now it flies as the fixed wing aircraft. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of quadcopter versus fixed wing aircraft? The biggest advantage of a fixed wing aircraft is the range and endurance. Because what happens is that once the aircraft takes off, the weight of the aircraft is supported by the surrounding air or the lift force. When you have the quadcopter, 
for the quadcopter to hover, you have to spend battery. So the endurance speed of the fixed wing aircraft is better than quadcopter. But the disadvantage of fixed wing aircraft is you have to maintain certain speed. Fixed wing aircraft cannot hover. So if you have a fixed wing aircraft, it needs to maintain certain speed. Otherwise, it will drop down as a rock. So basically, the aircraft, they are used uh, for transportation. <clears throat> Quadcopters, they are very agile. Uh, they maneuver. Uh, they are super uh, nimble compared to the fixed wing aircraft. Fixed wing aircraft need some finite radius to turn. Fixed wing aircraft uh, need more material, expensive manufacturing, but quadcopters or octocopters, uh, they are uh, used for uh, maybe small duration, uh, sudden flight regimen change. And uh, so small, uh, in the case of small unmanned ve vehicles, fixed wing aircrafts have their applications and quadcopters have their application. But recent advancements in the hardware, microcontroller, sensors, uh, fuel the boom in quadcopter. So you can see these small, small drones, toy drones that do excellent like flip, uh, 4D flip, 8D flip. So uh, fixed wing aircraft doing a flip is uh, not easy. So because at certain, certain point, uh, when the fixed wing aircraft uh, reaches, so there is certain angle of attack, which is the angle between the incoming air and the cord uh, axis. If it exceeds beyond certain region, the lift generation drops and there is only drag. So fixed wing aircraft needs to maintain a uh, certain speed and certain angle of attack so that it can fly straight. Now, in this uh, chapter, uh, I would try to give you the overview of the syllabus. So we, what we are going to look at is we are going to look at something like the physical system, which is the actual real robot. Uh, then we will look at the mathematical model of the robot starting from the very first principle, like force is equal to mass times acceleration. And torque is equal to I, which is moment of inertia multiplied by angular acceleration. So we'll start with those equations. We will derive the ordinary differential equations. Then we will look at the forces and the moments that are acting on the aircraft. And many a times you will notice that these mathematical models are very complex, but for actual system to simulate or to run or to control, you do not need these highly complex mathematical models. So what we do is we construct equivalent reduced order models, which are like small mathematical models that can be implemented, simulated and controlled uh, in real time. So we construct something called as a low order model. Then essentially from there, we try to linearize those because once we do the linearization, then the system uh, can be controlled using the linear techniques. And here is the trick that we use. So imagine if you look at that aircraft, the original model of the aircraft is going to be a very highly nonlinear complicated model. Now, what we are going to do is that aircraft is going to fly during certain operating regions. We would linearize those equations of motion about those specific operating point. In the in the term aerospace terminology, this is called as Trimming. So trimming means achieving steady state linear flight conditions. So we have that complicated model and think about it. It's a nonlinear model, 
but what we are going to do is we are going to place linear approximations at the operating points and understand that this linear approximation is valid around this operating point. As soon as aircraft goes to the next operating point, this linearization is not valid, but you have another linearization. So what you do is you have these different, different linear models that you combine together and that gives you an approximate linear model of the nonlinear system. What is the beauty of that approximate linearization? Because then you can use the simple controller techniques like PID to control the aircraft about those operating points. And you can do it mathematically or you can do it numerically. So MATLAB has the LINMOD and uh, trimming functions that we can use to perform numerical linearization. So that will give you the linear models at those operating points. And once you have a linear model, controlling that model is super easy. You can use a PID or you can use a state space or any fast given optimal control. You use any control and then you can control it. Most of the times, this approach works. The This approach fails when that aircraft is performing highly nonlinear maneuvers. For an example, uh, if you are designing a fighter plane or if you are designing a quadcopter that is doing 8D flips, then the linear approximation will not work and you have to go to the actual nonlinear system. We will talk about it step by step, but again, there are tricks uh, uh, that you can use to make that process easy. So now this, these, this actually this slide summarizes our entire course. So this, if you are wondering what this complicated set of equations are, this is nothing but Newton's law. I want you to read these equations with me. Pn dot, Pe dot, and H dot. That is the application of Newton's law in X, Y, and Z direction. Mx double dot is equal to F. The only thing is uh, you basically do one more integration and then you have something called as uh, Pn dot. So then you have u dot, v dot, w dot. Those are the angular acceleration. So basically the rate of change of angular velocity. So that is Newton's law in the rotational frame. Rotation about x, u dot. Rotation about y, w dot. Rotation about, uh, rotation about y, v dot. And rotation about v is w dot. So the first six equations are nothing but applications of Newton's laws. Now you may ask me, this equation looks super complicated. That is true because when you have an aircraft flying, the problem is the aerodynamic forces are in different coordinate frames. The weight of the aircraft is an inertial coordinate frame and the angles that represent the relationship between these two are in different coordinate frames. So all these signs and cosines and whatever you see, that is trying to make dollars to dollars and pesos to pesos, which means get all these forces, get all these movements, get all these vectors in one coordinate system. That is what all this is all about. So you have force is equal to mass times acceleration. Those forces are in different coordinate frame. Those accelerations are in different coordinate frame. You cannot apply Newton's law to the forces and accelerations. They are in two different coordinate frames. You need to bring those two in some consistent coordinate frame using this rotation matrices and then equate left-hand side 
is equal to right hand side. Cannot add dollars to pesos, dollars to dollars, pesos to pesos. That's why that equation, the first three equations, they have cosine sine terms. Second set of equations, you will realize that has some gyroscopic cross terms, and there is something called as rho v square s divided by 2. So rho v square divided by 2, it's called as dynamic pressure. So what is dynamic pressure? I just want to give you a very practical understanding of dynamic pressure. This is a thought experiment. Don't do it. Imagine you are driving your car. Maybe it's a Tesla Model 3, 0 to 60 in 3 seconds. And you go from 0 to 60 in 3 seconds. And just for the sake of it, what you do is you put your hand outside. What happens is all of a sudden you feel your palm being pressurized by the incoming air. And that pressure, what you feel, is because of the incoming air velocity. So basically, what happens is, if you look at the Bernoulli's principle, in fluid mechanics or fluid dynamics, you have kinetic energy, you have potential energy, and you have pressure energy. When the kinetic, so total energy is going to remain constant. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It only changes the form. So all of a sudden, when you have a fluid that is having some velocity, and its velocity gets changed, there is some change in the pressure because kinetic energy to pressure energy conversion. <coughs> Let me repeat this once again. In fluid mechanics, what we do is we use something called as Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli's equation and Navier-Stokes equation. Bernoulli's equation is the conservation of energy principle, which means the fluid has kinetic energy, potential energy, and pressure energy. So if kinetic energy drops down, that either the pressure or the potential energy should go up. If the potential energy is going to remain the same and the kinetic energy drops down, the pressure energy goes up. So rho v square by 2 is something similar to, uh, what is the expression for kinetic energy? 1 half m v square. Rho is nothing but a kilogram divided by beta cube. So basically, rho v square by 2 is equivalent of kinetic energy term in the fluids. But that get multiplied with S, which is the surface area. So that is an indication. That is that quantity, 1 half rho v square times S, is the dynamic pressure multiplied by area that gives you the force. Now, Cx alpha, Cxq, Cx delta C. So, uh, that is basically a coefficient that is dependent on the angle of attack alpha. Because I want you to visualize this experiment. Again, you are driving Tesla Model 3. You put your hand outside the window. And here is what you do. When your palm is horizontal, it's, it's like cutting the air. As soon as you change the orientation, which means you increase the angle of attack, all of a sudden you start feeling the lift. You increase it further, the lift increases. Increase it further, lift increases. But if you were to do it something like this, then what you have is you do not have any lift, but you have drag, which means the lift is dependent or coefficient of lift is dependent on the angle of attack, which is given as alpha. Then usually the fixed wing aircrafts, they have some type of propulsion. Uh, in this case, we are using, it's a prop. So what you have is you have rho, which is the density of air. Then S is the area of propeller multiplied by the speed, which is given by K times delta T and so on. So what you have is again, 
that expression is you are equating uh, Newton's law in the rotational coordinates. Tau is equal to I times alpha. So those equations as you go through, and then you have a simple kinematic model, and you have the similar model for the velocities. So these expressions are going to be very fundamentally important when we try to simulate a fixed wing aircraft. And I don't want you to worry about it because I'm going to go line by line and develop these equations from the first principle, Newton's law. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. And next part is, there are so many, yeah. So basically, uh, the propeller force is expressed in the inertial frame. So, but so you may have to transfer that prop force, which is nothing but the thrust force, into the plane where uh, or the coordinate frame where you are applying Newton's laws. So we will we'll talk about all these step by step. So these are the different coefficients. And these coefficients are expressed in terms of some other coefficients. And it may look scary, but we don't program these. These are standard available for a particular aircraft configuration or a particular aileron configuration or a particular flight surface. You get all these coefficients. So we just grab those and use them in program. Then next part is, we have these dynamical equations of motion. We simulate. And then the first thing that we are going to find is that aircraft is not stable. It crashes down. So what we do is we apply the controller. We can apply the linear controller. We can apply the nonlinear controller. And for that, we have control surfaces. So if you look at the, if you, if you fly uh, in an aircraft, if you happen to sit next to the wing, you will see those flaps that going up and down. Those are called ailerons. What do they do? They change the amount of drag and lift on the wings so that the aircraft can tilt. And then what you have is many aircrafts, they have rudder in the back and then they have elevator. So basically those are the surfaces of the aircraft. They are deflected they change the direction of aerodynamic forces that allow aircraft to turn, rotate, go up, go down. So what we do is, for those, we have actuators. And those are hydraulic actuators. And basically, they push and pull those uh, planes and the surfaces. So basically, you can control the aircraft motion. And clearly, what we do is uh, we to, con to control the motion of a uh, surface, for example, aileron, what we need to do is we need to come up with a mathematical model for the aileron. And then we simplify that model using uh, linearization. And then at the end, we use Laplace transform and then uh, build a transfer function. And this transfer function gets implemented in the inside controller loop to control the aircraft. And then what happens is you start with the innermost uh, transfer function. You close that inner loop transfer function, which means you control the inner transfer function. Then you kind of go out and then you close the outside loop then you go further out and then you close the furthermost loop. This technique of control is called successive loop closure. So what we do is we control the most critical dynamics in the innermost loop. And then subsequently we go outside and we apply the controller to control the entire aircraft. So we will talk about the successive loop closures and this technique is used 
in autopilots all the way from hobby grade autopilot to the pickup. So what they do is they successively close the loops so that each sub component uh, of the aircraft is stabilized. And then finally the entire aircraft is stabilized. And you do that in all uh, three axes, X, Y, and Z, and all three rotations. Now, when we design the control, we, uh, we have multiple objectives. First and foremost, we want the aircraft to fly stable. So we want the aircraft to be stable. Then we want that aircraft to maintain a certain altitude and attitude. And then we want that aircraft to follow certain path. So basically, look at the if you look at what we studied in the trajectory planning, same concepts they are applied for the path planning in the case of UAVs. So what are the typical steps when you try to design the control? What you do is you look at the complicated model, then first and foremost simplify that model and come up with a linear low order model. Then next step is in, uh, understand the how that model is operating, implement that model in a simulation environment like MATLAB or Gazebo or VREP, any simulation environment that you like, and then implement the control logic system model, and then expand that model uh, to the physical system, perform some experiments, tune the controller, and repeat this process for all the, the operating regions. That is how you actually proceed. So as you can see, uh, the UAV needs to know what is around uh, the UAV. Like that's why you have IMUs, accelerometers, gyroscopes. You also have cameras, maniac, and you also have GPS. So all these sensors are feeding to this UAV and then these sensors are noisy. So we have to use some type of an estimation, some kind of Kalman filtering, particle filtering to find out the best possible solution. That solution gets fed into the autopilot, path following algorithm, path manager and path planner. And then the first step is autopilot is going to stabilize then it's going to implement the path following control and then path following control will actually perform complete the trajectory and then as it goes through these steps there will be external disturbances there will be servo commands there will be some group delays all those things we have to take care of uh, inside the control logic for a successful flight if you were to add an external sensor like camera, or if you were to add some type of a vision-based guidance, then it sits on top of the path manager. So you can implement some type of obstacle avoidance, or maybe you can do real-time maneuvering of the aircraft, or you can perform some type of object recognition. So this is the whole structure of the course. Uh, this course is going to be a lot of fun. So uh, any question, this is the chapter one from your textbook. Any questions? So if there are no questions, let's look at the most important chapter, which is the coordinate frames. And to be honest with you, you know this material, these coordinate frames are the exact same coordinate frames that you studied in Robotics 1. The only difference here is I want to caution you that some nomenclature may be different. So uh, the rotation matrices, what they talk about, uh, the nomenclature or wording or the way they represent could be different, but at the end, the mathematics is the same. So now what is a reference frame? Reference frame 
is nothing but a triad. And we have been looking at this for a very, very long time. So for an example, you have X, you have Y, and you have Z. Uh, so X has a unit vector, I'm gonna call I. Y has a unit vector J, and Z has the unit vector K. Now, please try to understand when we are trying to study the aircraft, that aircraft has a very complex motion profile. That aircraft has so many different types of forces acting on that aircraft. For an example, the, these rotation frames or the reference frames are super critical because aircraft is having certain air speed. That air speed is the forward speed of the aircraft in the air that is expressed in a different coordinate frame. On the other hand, that aircraft has certain ground speed, which means if that aircraft was on ground, what would be the speed of that aircraft? That is expressed in a different coordinate frame. That aircraft is receiving GPS signals. Those GPS signals are referenced to the earth center, earth fixed. It means imagine this earth. At the center of the earth, we have an inertial coordinate frame the GPS coordinates are with respect to that inertial frame, which is located at the center of the earth, which is fixed to the earth. So you are getting the GPS, sense, uh, GPS data. The aircraft has sensors on the aircraft, which means the accelerometers and gyros that are on the aircraft, they are rotating along with aircraft. So the output of that sensor, the, the gyroscope and accelerometer is going to be in the vehicle body frame. So, so all these forces, all these motions that are on the aircraft, they are expressed in different, different coordinate frames. That's why we need multiple reference frames and we need to understand a very clear relationship between how to go from the inertial frame all the way to the vehicle frame. Now, if you look at it, uh, uh, we apply Newton's law. Newton's laws cannot be applied in the relativistic frame. If you want to apply Newton's law in relativistic frame, you have to use the theory of relativity. So Newton's laws are applied in inertial frame. So at the end of the day, all the forces that are in the body frame, intermediate frame, sensor data, which is in different, different frames, need, we need to combine those together and transfer that onto a consistent frame. Aircraft has certain attitude. Attitude means the rotations. So you have roll, pitch, and yaw. So these three rotations, aircraft has these three rotations. Aircraft also has aerodynamic forces, aerodynamic moments. They are acting on the aircraft. You have accelerometers, you have gyros, and you have different path and mission requirements. So we express these in different, different coordinate frame. And at the end, we transfer those coordinate frame to most likely inertial coordinate frame so that the whole system can be solved. So it's extremely important to understand what different frames are in the aircraft nomenclature, what are the forces acting on the aircraft, and at which frame that those forces are expressed. But at the end, we start with something <laughs> that we started uh, in Robotics 1. Remember, we have two frames, and one frame is rotated with respect to other frame, and how do we find out the relationship between these two frames? Do we remember? That was the first thing that we did in Robotics 2. So I'm going to do a quick recap. 
just for my own satisfaction. I know all of you remember this, but for my own satisfaction, I'm going to do a quick recap. So this is how I explained this in robotics one. So what we have is we have a frame X zero Y zero. This is the old frame. And this is the new frame, which is X one and Y one. And clearly by now you should know the right hand coordinate frame system. So this is going to be Z one and then I have Z. Just in case, if you are wondering what the right hand coordinate frame is, curl uh, your uh, two fingers. This is X, this is Y, Z is coming out. So if you look at the frame which I have drawn, you have X going towards right, Y going towards up, Z coming out. Curl your fingers in the direction of rotation. If your thumb is pointing towards the axis, uh, that rotation is positive. For an example, if you look at, if you were to go from X naught, Y naught, to x1, y1, the rotation is something like this. So you curl your fingers in the direction of rotation and you realize that this rotation, which is about z, is something like theta z. Are you with me? So this is a positive rotation. Now, how do we find out the transformation matrix? And the, the transformation matrix is found which is like projection of, of projection on. So projection of new frame, the new frame is X1, Y1, Z1. The old frame is X0, Y0, Z0. So the new frame is X1, Y1, Z1. The old frame is X0, Y0, Z0. Now let's, and I, I need to explain this because uh, most of you probably took robotics one, but there are quite a few students who took TGR 547, not robotics one. So I need to explain this. So bear with me. Can you see that Z0 and Z1, they are aligned? So the projection of Z1 on X0 is zero. Do you agree with me? Projection of Z1 on Y0 is zero. But projection of Z1 on Z0 is one. Do you agree with me? So this becomes the first part. Zero, zero, one. Now next part is, look at the projection. So let's look at X1. So if I want to find out the projection, I need to find out this vertical distance. Imagine the distance is unit. So basically it's just one. So this distance is cosine theta Z. This distance is sine theta Z. And now I want you to understand that if I want to resolve the vector, if I want to resolve the vector O X one, if I want to resolve the vector, what I have is I have a horizontal vector, which is in this direction. And I have a vertical vector in this direction. The horizontal vector, which is cosine theta Z is in the same direction as X naught. So the projection of X1, projection of X1 on X naught, projection of X1 on X naught is cosine theta Z. Do you agree with me? Cosine theta Z. Projection of X1 onto Y naught is sine theta Z. But please understand that vector is going up which is the same direction as Y naught. So that projection is positive. So sine theta Z. And projection of X1 
on z naught is zero. Why? Because those two vectors are perpendicular to each other. Now I will have to repeat the same process for y. So if you look at the projection, this angle is theta z. So what you have here is cosine theta z. And you have here as sine theta z. So if you want to look at the projection of y1 onto y0 is going to be cosine theta z. Projection of y1 on y0 is cosine theta z. But projection of y1 on x0 Please understand that projection, the vector is going towards left, which is opposite of the positive x naught direction, which means it has to be negative. Are you with me? This is the matrix that we used almost everywhere in our calculations. You can follow the same process. You can follow the same process and find out the rotation transformations about y naught, and you can find the rotation transformations about z naught. Any questions about these rotation matrices? Yes. Oh, why the the matrix calculated here is different than this? Very good question. Before I go to this, are you okay with this? Everyone understood? So now let me give you a little bit of interpretation. X0 can be replaced by the unit vector representing the coordinate X0. Y0 is represented by the unit vector representing the coordinate Y0. Z0 is represented by the unit vector representing z0. So now what I'm going to do is, and this is where it becomes interesting. I'm going to write down something like this. I naught, j naught, k naught is equal to, I have this rotation matrix. And then I have these unit vectors I1, J1, K1. So please understand if I want to find out the projection, what I need to repeat or I need to copy this matrix over here. So let me do that. This will become cosine theta z sin theta z 0, sin theta minus sin theta z, cosine theta z 0, 0, 0, 1. This matrix is an orthonormal matrix. What do I mean by an orthonormal matrix? If you find out the determinant of this matrix, it is going to be 1 multiplied by cosine square theta 2 minus of minus sine square theta 2 sine square theta 2 plus cosine square theta 2 is 1. So the determinant of this guy is 1. Do you agree with me? <laughs> now, here is something that I want you to observe. This is the first column vector. This is the second column vector. This is the third column vector. So this is a vector. This is a vector. This is a vector. This is the first row vector, second row vector, third row vector. If you take the dot product of any vector with respect to other vector, if you take the dot product of any vector with respect to other vector, you will notice that that dot product is zero. 
what is the meaning of dot product being zero, which means those two vectors are perpendicular to each other. What that means is this row vector or the column. So in this matrix, this vector is perpendicular to this vector, is perpendicular to this vector, which means this is an orthonormal matrix. Determinant is equal to one and all the vectors are perpendicular to each other. And that kind of makes sense because how did the rotation matrix got derived? We derived the rotation matrix by taking the projections on the three perpendicular axes. What it means is those are the basis vectors that are representing the rotation. So they have to be perpendicular. So this matrix is an orthonormal matrix. So this is an orthonormal matrix. And this matrix is giving me what? It is describing the relationship between I0, J0, K0 on the left hand side and I1, J1 and K1 on the right hand side. But now, if I want to represent, if I want to take this matrix, which is on the right hand side, to the left hand side, what I will have to do is, I will have to multiply by the inverse of the rotation matrix on the left side and on the left side. So what I have here is I have this rotation matrix R. And I'm going to just write down the, the vector something like this. So I have, uh, I would call it just X naught is equal to R and X one. I multiply, pre-multiply by the inverse on the both sides. So I have R inverse, which is I naught J naught K naught is equal to R inverse multiplied by R. This is I1, J1, K1. This gives me identity. So now this relationship, and I want you to note, is nothing but I1, J1, K1 is equal to R inverse I naught J naught K naught. You agree with me? Any question in the math? Finding out inverse is a very complicated problem. But the beauty of orthonormal matrix is this is the beauty of orthonormal matrix that the inverse is equal to transpose. Since this matrix is orthonormal, R inverse is equal to R transpose. So what that means, and I want you to understand that uh, I can write this something like I1, J1, K1 is equal to, and I'm gonna write, just write the transpose of this. So transpose of this is first row, cosine theta z minus sine theta z zero. Second row, sine theta z cosine theta z zero. Third row, zero, zero, one. And you have I naught, J naught, and K naught. Can you see this is the exact same matrix that is being derived over here. The only thing, the way they derived it, is they derived it in a slightly different fashion, finding out the dot products. But at the end of the day, what this is, this is telling me, one, one, <coughs> one. So I1, J1, K1 is equal to this matrix multiplied by I0, J0, K0. Are you with me so far? 
and this is slightly the difference between uh, the aerospace uh, nomenclature. But at the end, uh, this is what is all about. Everyone understood this? Now, the next part is, again, this, this slide summarizes what we talked about, the rotations. And, and I want you to understand this rotation is slightly, this, this note, so, so the, the nomenclature is slightly different. And in this book, what this means is you have I1, J1, K1 is equal to 1, R0 multiplied by I0, J0, K0. Everyone understood this? This is how that matrix is written. So whenever you see the nomenclature like this, this, if you want to express this in the convention that we used in robotics one, that convention we used is one R zero. So, so basically this is the rotation about J axis. So as you can see, you have one over here then this is the rotation about I axis. So this is one R zero. So you have again, I one J one K one is equal to I zero J zero K zero. And these are the properties of orthonormal matrices. So inverse, is equal to transpose. Uh, when you multiply these, I need to write this rule down. So what this is, is this rule. Actually, you know this. Remember 0 R1 multiplied by 1 R2 is equal to 0 R2 that we talked about in robotics one. That is exactly the same thing. C R B uh, multiplied by B R A so BB goes C, R, T. And the last one is since this matrix is orthonormal, the determinant of this matrix is equal to uh, one. Everyone understood this? Uh, for my, my own satisfaction, when I talked about the dot product, everyone really understood what I mean by dot product. So what I mean by that is if I take this uh, column vector and if I take this second column vector dot, so this is one vector, this is another vector. So I'm going to call this vector A, I'm going to call this vector B. Dot product of a vector A and B, dot product of vector A and B is A, B, cosine theta. Do you agree with me? But now when the vector is represented in the matrix form, the dot product is represented as uh, something like you have so 1, 0, 0 multiplied by 0 cosine theta minus sine theta. This is the draw dot product. So basically A transpose B. That is the definition of dot product when the vector is represented as a matrix vector form. So first row, first column, zero multiplied by one plus cosine theta multiplied by zero plus zero multiplied by sine theta is going to give me zero. What it means is the dot product of these two quantities is zero. And what this implies is here, the theta is 90 degrees. That's, this means theta is equal to 90 degrees. Are you with me so far? 
okay i'm going to stop here today uh but what i would encourage you to look at is uh there is a slightly different representation of coordinate frames and then we will look at uh, different frames in the aircraft